Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me? Just very, very inspirational what we just heard. Um, I'm hoping I can complement this. Um, I'm very grateful for Jakob or for presenting all these few points that very close to my heart, so I don't have to repeat them. <laughs> um, actually, I'm also grateful for Marco, who kindly invited me to come here, because uh, Marco has been studying in our experimental uh, teacher training program that is actually trying to follow all these principles um, uh, of agency and participation and democracy of students. And our teacher students in Finland, uh, they study five years, class teachers. Marco is going to be a subject matter teacher, but uh, class teachers study five years in a program that's combined bachelor and master. And we have very high quality and high level of education, but it's also been a bit conservative. Uh, so my students have educational psychology as major, and they start from the year one to be part of the uh, community, uh, and they start long-term phenomenon-based projects and long-term small group processes and learn about learning. And, and actually, they've been always designing their own study plans, or at least nowadays they are allowed to participate in designing their own study plans. Uh, so I'm not alone, but we, have a, uh, we are a community of uh, university lecturers, PhD students, and we also have nowadays a custom of involving first-year first freshmen in this program. So we have days where we have everybody from first-year students to professor together uh, uh, talking about and sharing about and creating our community for educational psychology. You, you were looking at this picture, Mind the Gap, and uh, as Jakob stated, there are gaps. There is a gap between what happens inside school and outside schools, but we are also looking at what happens when society and technologies and social digital practices change very rapidly, and the school doesn't follow. So uh, the school is kind of becoming uh, a museum uh, in contrast to the society and the uh, knowledge practices of, of young people. I don't know how many of you are tweeting here, following tweets, or in that sense kind of uh, connecting to the network outside this hall, and already we are sharing ideas. Uh, I was sharing ideas by previous te uh, speech uh, to the people who are following tweets around the world. So what I'm talking about is, uh, first, I'm upset about problems, and then I, I would like to talk about a bit of new study plans of Finland, like 21st century skills that are going to be introduced this fall. All the teachers around Finland are now working on these new study programs. And what is funny, they are very close to what we've been doing in educational psychology for quite a long time, and I'm very happy that these ideas are now, and Otavan Opisto as well, this phenomenon-based learning, and all these kind of student-centered approaches are now coming mainstream, hopefully. So I'm a bit talking about this generational slash, uh, clash, not going very far from it, but then also I'm even starting with the problem of school engagement and social and emotional learning, and then play arts, music, sports, handicraft, mentioning assessment briefly, and then going back to different kinds of engaging ways of reorganizing teaching and learning practices. So, one problem, um, I actually have a very brilliant Indian postdoc called Amandeep Deer, and we are starting a worldwide project on boredom <laughs> at school, because we think that boredom is a very dangerous state of mind. I hope you're not bored right now. <laughs> But um, it's actually a stressful physiological state. If you get bored, uh, then you start, your blood pressure goes up and you start producing stress hormones. So it's a very stressful state for a young person, especially teenagers, to experience boredom. And the lack of engagement is getting really to be a problem in Finnish schools. I've been telling that we have pizza in our heads. <laughs> too much PISA in our heads, which means that too much emphasizing all kinds of test results, 
although in Finnish school system there are no high-stake tests and examinations before the age of 18. PISA is actually the only test, so that's why maybe people are doing well, because they're not still overworked with all kinds of assessment, kind of national high-stake assessments. But this is our latest study about um, school engagement in, among already 12-year-old Finnish uh, Helsinki, actually, children. I hope I can use this. Um, only 50% are in the group what we called engaged. Here is engage, study engagement, exhaustion, cynicism and inadequacy. Exhaustion, cynicism and inadequacy are all three components of burnout. And what is interesting, in this so-called engaged groups, uh, they are kind of lukewarm. They are not highly engaged, even if they are in the group of not being burned out. But then there is a group of students who are very stressed, a uh, group of students who are very feel inadequate, and then group who has all kinds of problems, especially cynicism, and then group of risk of cynicism. Uh, and you're looking at the education system that's supposed to be uh, one of the best in the world. And you see that we are really not doing very well when it comes to engagement. We are now doing international comparisons with this and seeing how it looks like. But I believe that motivation and engagement are also outcomes of school. They are outcomes that should be measured, not only cognitive uh, development of learning facts and knowledge. So, I'm so happy for the previous speech because this is really what we need in Finland. We need people who can collaboratively solve so-called wicked problems of the world, like climate change, lack of democracy, a global financial crisis and things like that. Uh, people who, if we want to have active citizens, we cannot train them just to listen for teachers. And as presented, this kind of physical arrangement, how we organize, for instance, this lecture hall, by definition, is not a very democratic place. This is not uh, how we would organize our teaching and learning practices um, at the university in the future. Um, also, are we integrating technologies in a meaningful way so that uh, knowledge practices of students outside school would become natural parts of their everyday learning. Usually people just bring in technologies and they don't have a clue how to engage people uh, by using technologies. So my question is, are we alienating our students with our old-fashioned knowledge practices? One question. So now these are the Finnish uh, so-called 21st century skills that I introduced in our new study plans. First is, of course, thinking skills and learning how to learn. So when somebody graduates, they are supposed to want to learn more instead of saying that I won't read a book again, never again in my life because I finished all school. <laughs> Lifelong learning. Uh, cultural competencies. I'm afraid we are not very good at that. There are countries like Canada, New Zealand, uh, other countries, even Sweden, who are much more advanced when it comes to intercultural competencies. Then communication skills and self-expression. Many of us are quite of shy and reserved, not, not this crowd though. Uh, there is this saying, what is the difference between introverted Finn and extroverted Finn? Do you know that? When you are talking to an introverted Finn, she's looking at her shoes. And when you're talking to an extroverted Finn, she's looking at your shoes. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so we are people who are slowly warming up, yet we are not kind of rushing to hug for strangers. Uh, so that's why we are also developing new kinds of ways of learning and teaching so that our shyness and reserved um, uh, manners can be softened and we can express us, ourselves more clearly. So, then one is to take care of yourself and your everyday life. Then multiple literacies. I think that includes social media, but it includes all kinds of different kinds of literacies. Understanding what is, what is crap, what is trolling, what is real news, 
and being critical citizens who can evaluate of knowledge constantly. ICT competencies, that's kind of self-evident. Uh, Work-life skills and ent entrepreneurship, it doesn't mean that everybody becomes greedy and trying to make money, but this kind of attitude that I, I'm an enter entrepreneur of my own life. But then I would like to focus on the last one, which is the most difficult, I think, for the current school system, agency and active citizenship. And uh, I feel a bit humbled because I'm not, as you can see, I'm not a specialist in any democratic education or sociology or anything like that. But what I'm looking at is how to change school so that it becomes promoting agency in children. And I took a risk, actually, um, I implemented yesterday four new slides because I was so impressed about this is going to be very boring, this next, no, it's not going to be boring. Somewhat theoretical and these are already new things for me because Antti Rajala, one of our educational psychology students, defended his PhD and um, here is actually a link to the whole thesis and four publications and everything. But I've been struggling with the concept of agency, so I'm going to be a bit boring and give some definitions. But what Antti is actually saying, Antti is not only focusing on how individuals are inculturated into existing social practices. I'm reading this out loud because we are EFL and this is a bit complex. Uh, for me too, because I'm really fascinated by Antti's thoughts. He used to be my, my student as well. It's not just like participating in existing practices, but also how to contribute to transform the norms, discourses and forms of activity in their own communities. I think this is wonderful. Learning inevitably involves a struggle over what counts as knowledge and whose knowledge counts. Like, uh, are, is children's knowledge accounted as knowledge? or only teachers' knowledge. The next point, what, what Antti, Antti is actually speaking is about expansive knowledge. So this is very current stuff. He defended last week, and I was in his committee, so I had the pleasure of, of reading this thesis. So what it started is, is expanding our ex, uh, educational practices, started with questioning the existing social practices, and then coming, comes the critical analysis, and modeling new forms of activity, then we implement these forms and reflect on the changes and eventually the consolidation of new practice. And of course this is cyclic. It doesn't follow anything kind of stable, but this is a constant process. So there is a qualitative transformation of an activity and then we reconceptualize this whole thing. And what is beautiful is it involves learning what does not yet exist like 70% past, 10% 10, 10 of future. But this is learning about something that's not yet there. Uh, learning to create future. Then my dear friend Kai Hakkarainen, we've been working on progressive inquiry-based learning, talks about knowledge practices. What we have inside and outside school, we have personal knowledge practices, social knowledge practices, but then there are these institutional routines like exams, uh, lectures, uh, seminars. Um, but then there are some teachers who have this expansive new kind of knowledge practices that are actually helping them to change their teaching. But why is it so rare? Why are there so few te uh, teachers who have been able to develop these inquiry-based systems. It's probably because these schools are not democratic. If there is an isolated teacher who is democratic and trying to do something in the classroom, it's very difficult because the community doesn't support that. So many teachers who are here experience this. They go back to their own country and they feel that they are lonely with their uh, efforts to, to make true democracy in their classroom. And then, definition, new definition of agency, which was very, um, I don't know about you, but psychologists usually have it like, you have agency, you have agency. Even Csikszentmihalyi talks about autotelic personality, like if it was some kind of my thing, I'm either agentic or not. 
but instead thinking about the realized capacity of people to act upon and transform their activities and change their own social circumstances. That would be agency. Sounds very dangerous at school. Um, so it's all the time mediated by our discursive and practical stews. So actually, if we want to change student agency, we need to change the social relations and the whole classroom and how it interacts and how we um, treat each other and how students treat um, each other. So the problem is, is that in agency, there is always a seed of revolution. That's why the leaders of many countries don't want students to be agentic because there is always this dilemma between promoting agency and then all these institutional demands of knowledge transmission and how to manage the classroom. And, and I think every day in teacher education I'm struggling with this thing because from the central administration comes all this, you have to do this, this and that, and then I'm trying to be agentic and foster agency in my own students. There are also generation clashes, um, like, the, like the school as it was designed, was designed by so-called baby boomers. They thought radio was dangerous because it would destroy reading, because we, people would just be listening to radio. And telephone came and it was supposed to destroy face-to-face -face conversation. I'm belonging to this uh, Generation X. I was a telly generation. I was supposed to be passive. A zombie who was just sitting in front of TV. And then came all these computers when I was in the 80s, PCs, uh, floppy disks, then CDs and so on. But what is interesting, my elder daughter, who, is, who was born in 1991, she's already Generation Y, digital cameras, DVDs. But her little sister, who was born in 1995, is already gen next generation, because she was born in 1995, I got my first mobile phone in 1996, and then internet started to become general in 1995 and so on. So it goes exponentially, these technologies. Even my children represent different generations. Previous generations, it took like 20 or 30 years um, before things change so fast. And school is not following this. <laughs> That's my elder daughter, actually. Selfie was the uh, uh, word of uh, the word of 2014. Uh, I'm not claiming that these kids are good at using computers, but what I'm saying, their social practices and be ways of being in the world are different. They are very much multitasking. They are not printing. They are reading from the screen. Gaming is very popular even in older generations. Many gamers are plus 40, actually. <laughs> um, but all kind of social digital networking, which goes beyond classroom and uh, using mobile devices. Um, and they are very dependent on mobile devices. Sometimes, sometimes they think they even need like rehab because they're totally lost if there is no Wi-Fi. Well, we are saying that school is like aeroplane. <laughs> it's like you go to school in the morning and say, please put down, please fasten your seatbelt and put down all your electronic devices and you may put them on after seven hours when we are landing to New York. So, <laughs> school is like seven hours offline. <laughs> it's like uh, overseas flight. Um, and imagine the boredom of children who are used to all these devices and suddenly they go to school and they are like, can you get the boys? Everything off. So, uh, I wrote a report for EU Parliament about this. Um, we developed some new terms, like social digital technologies. So, there is a system of, of technological tools, social media and internet. And they kind of enable constant and intensive uh, interaction between people. And then what we also call social digital participation in the society. So these are these informal social digitally mediated 
uh, knowledge practices. I met these democracy people who were saying that they are doing projects on democracy in classrooms, and then I said, oh, that's interesting. Um, what is the role of Twitter in this? And they said, we are not interested in technologies. I was like, how can you do research on participation in the society if you're not at all interested in social media? Remember Obama and Middle East and everything. Uh, but th that's a problem. There is truly a gap between my generation and the next generation when it comes to this learning. So what we looked at, whether there are actually digital natives in Finland, and we found that readiness to use technologies of 12 years old and even 16 year old was not that advanced. But most students were, were what we called um, basic participators. They kind of didn't very extensively make use of these social digital tools. Then there were gamers, and only 10% would do something creative, to creatively collaborate with these tools, creating like movies, vlogs, something like that. And then, can you guess who did the best at school? Basic participators, gamers, or creative users? Basic. Actually, <laughs> when we looked at academic performance, uh, creative participators were most likely to report lower grades. And uh, when we look at academic well-being, gaming-oriented and, and creative reported lower school value and cynicism towards school already at the age of 12. And also, creative uh, participators felt inadequate at school. That's really funny because their technological skills were the best. But they didn't, there was no way of using them at school. Um, so, yes, they were also exhausted. Maybe they're doing at night, maybe they were doing all these things at night time, and then that's why they were exhausted at school. We are looking now, our latest research is also about sleep patterns. <laughs> so there is a gap between this flexible use of digital media and internet searches and extended networks and knowledge creation practices that are common with these young people. They're constantly consulting each other, creating something together. When they come to school, it's linear, poor mental performance assessed, textbooks, offline, paper and pencil, close classroom community, and more knowledge transmission rather than knowledge creation. Um, and this applies also workplaces. There are different kinds of cultures in the workplace. And what we are talking about is transgenerational learning, generations learning from each other. Uh, there is a lot of wisdom in our generation and older people, and there, but there are lots of things that we could learn from children. My daughters have taught me everything about Facebook and Twitter. I, I would be totally helpless with those things without my, my daughters and my students who are teaching me constantly. But then, uh, I just put this picture here because we also do research on communication skills and social-emotional learning. I don't want you to think I'm a technocrat. <laughs> um, so, all this self-awareness, self-management, also managing your tools at school, because uh, you have to be able to reciprocally regulate your learning. It's very, if you, everybody's just looking at their machines and nobody's really interacting uh, in face-to-face -face situation, uh, then you should learn how to regulate this at school. And teachers and students should learn from each other and also students and pupils. Uh, actually, they are learning all the time. They're developing different kinds of new kinds of practices like um, I talk too much. I, I'm looking at the watch, but I have to tell you this story. Um, when young people to go to McDonald's or whatever, uh, they usually have this kind of etiquette that they put all the mobile devices on the table in silent mode. And the one, the one who first touches the mobile phone pays the whole bill. <laughs> so I, I would call that shared regulation. Because they realize that they want to be face-to-face -face and they want to be connected 
uh, with those people who are present. Uh, and they have to kind of create these kind of self-regulation rules, co-regulation rules to, to do it. But there are so many ethical choices, empathy, understanding, uh, all kinds of things that are also learning outcomes, I would claim. And if we can teach uh, teachers and students for these kinds of social and emotional learning skills, we can actually prevent burnout and, and increase school engagement. But school is so busy in delivering knowledge, so that there is very seldom time to truly look at these kinds of skills. So what is special about Finnish school? Uh, many people, my husband is a classroom teacher, and there are people like from Japan coming to his classroom, and they're like, what are they doing here? There's a lot of handicraft, music, arts and sports during the school day, and they are also school subjects. And I wanted to put here a picture. This is how we are studying, teaching and learning uh, with my students now. We, we had to create this kind of engaging learning environment so that uh, they are gaming here and they are... That's a catch box. What I could do, I could throw a microphone there and we could um, interact. And they're doing animation workshops and even food and, and drawing on the walls and so on. So what we're trying to do in teacher education is to reorganize um, the learning spaces so that our teacher students would already during their teacher education, uh, they are there five years with us, five and a half years, and they're also doing internship at school uh, to learn how to kind of change their, constantly change their own knowledge practices and ways of uh, social interaction. The problem is when they go to school and their school looks, still looks like this. <laughs> um, that's sometimes problematic. So then there is this problem. I'm not going very deeply into this because of lack of time, but assessment is actually the tail that wags the dog. So it calls backwash effect. With a stupid assessment, you can wash away all the effects of meaningful learning. Because we feel that assessment is integral part of learning. Um, and also authentic assessment, it supports meaningful learning. But very often the assessment practices are the major obstacles of changing everything. Anything. I've been to Africa and, every, and, and we are building new kinds of sustainable schools there. And, Oh, don't touch our curriculum. Be careful. We want our st uh, students to do well in tests so they can proceed. There is constantly this idea. So we need to develop new practices to support a, uh, assessment that supports deep level agency. And assessment doesn't have to be examinations. It's as assessment can, you know, can have very many forms. But we need to th rethink about assessment if we want to really change the school. So we have some promising innovations, like our engaging learning environment that we built at the teacher training. Then uh, knowledge building. I, I'm a student of Berider and Scardamalia from Canada, and they started this knowledge building approach, collaborative knowledge creation, already in the 80s. But then inquiry-based, problem-based, case-based, and now this phenomenon-based learning which we've been doing for, for the last 10 years in educational psychology is, is having projects where we are studying phenomenon, like an Otavanopisto as well, like life and death, uh, from mathematics, integrating mathematics, arts, uh, literature, music, uh, geography, to understand the phenomenon of life and death, not only intellectually, but also uh, also emotionally. Flipped classroom already mentioned. This is very much where, especially in mathematics, we are going in Finland. And then all kinds of playful learning and gaming kind of approaches. Um, the last one is a bit problematic in many ways. There are projects with Rovio and other uh, agents, but very often these kinds of things end up kind of kind of, a bit kind of superficial, like people getting gold money when they are accelerating in mathematic tasks. It becomes uh, sometimes somewhat behaviorist. 
But I'm, I'm believing that if we have more playful elements in learning, uh, playful, engaging uh, interactions, you don't need a computer to be playful. <laughs> So, and my own models, this is another boring uh, theoretical thing, but all these things, problem-based, case-based, case-based, um, phenomenon-based, we can analyze with this kind of model, less and more teacher-centered. But first, you find out what students already know, they diagnose, they activate their own thoughts, they bring all their knowledge and previous understanding then we feed forward, not feed back, feed forward their learning, support their learning, and then we start assessing the change that happens in thinking, not how many facts they remember, uh, to see whether there happens change in how the group works, in how the process works, in how uh, the quality of thinking changes, how people start understanding physics instead of just repeating some formulas or, or facts, and then looking at the goal, then there may be some summative evaluation, but then the new cycle starts. This is very contradictory to so-called bulimic learning model, which is like taking in information and puking it on the paper and then forgetting about it. Uh, what I mean, this is kind of uh, progressive, progressively, progressively deepening cycles of learning rather than course starts, course ends kind of linear thinking. This is how we try to make sense of our different kinds of uh, applications. And it's always diagnostic evaluation, which is uh, where we find out how people understand. And also, it's not only how they understand what we are saying, but they diagnosing what they are creating together and where they are going, very much like what Jakob was actually saying. So, this is not only virtual thing, it's physical, it's social, it's mental, um, and also emotional processes. And in order to change learning, we need to get rid of these kinds of settings uh, gradually and integrate more mobile devices and, and more all kinds of communication, ways of communication in our teaching and learning. Finally, I want to change my topic <laughs> in a way and go more to the, the joy of learning and more what I feel very meaningful thing. Um, I recently became, I studied working in Africa, in, in South Africa and Namibia, and we have projects um, that are kind of community-based psychology, which means that uh, obtention research focus area where I'm working, Northwest University, is not very fancy university, it's, it's black people's university. And, and my research group is trying to help unemployed youth and uh, making innovative things there. And this is one um, of the so-called oases in Orange Farm, which is near Johannesburg, Pretoria kind of area, which is very challenging, but they built this learning center there. And this writing is on the wall, be it the change you wish to see in the world. And there are, Actually, they promise I can take this picture, unemployed youth of the area, and they come to this center, and nobody's asking for diplomas, but they learn to make web pages in two weeks. Uh, and then, 10 of these young people already got jobs, but they didn't have very much prospects in their own community, selling drugs, prostitution, all kinds of problems that were very obvious, obvious choices. Uh, because unemployment rates were very high. And also, um, there is, I could talk about this endlessly, but I won't. Uh, there is Mr. Briggs, who used to be a football legend of South African uh, football soccer team. He could be a rich man and he could live in a fancy house like all of his colleagues. But he's invested most of his money to recycling centers and, and this kind of... Um, community where they have preschool for children from disadvantaged home. But I've seldom seen such a joy of learning as I witnessed there. Amazing uh, young people. Already these young people were really in a flow. Uh, I, I said, can I, in, they were there three hours in a row just doing, doing things with computer and enjoying. There was also air conditioning which was exceptional. 
Um, just really nice place because in many schools they were in kind of metal containers, uh, even daycare center where there's really, really hot. So what I was kind of summing up my research on joy of learning and motivation and emotion that are my current topics of research. What people actually need, they need meaningful context, especially children, curiosity and interest, uh, and challenges. People need challenges, but they also need to feel competent. That's the secret of flow experience or motivational experience. If the challenge is too high um, and the sense of efficacy is too low, then people get just anxious. So constant scaffolding of their learning and safe environment. This means in this case it's physically safe, but what I'm trying to do is a safe atmosphere uh, that everybody can Everybody can express themselves without being afraid that they are making fools of themselves. Uh, and that's, that's, I've noticed, especially in larger groups, that's very important. An active role of the learner. This is kind of self-evident in this conference. And promoting agency, and not like individual agency, but what we called, Annie Edwards is calling, um, relative agency. So that people are actually building their uh, each other's strengths, and then encouraging social interaction in all its forms. I think I end with this joy of learning thing, and if you want to know more about our projects and things that we are working on, here are some links, and, and maybe you can share my materials. Yes, I didn't see the watch, I hope I'm in time still, but thank you very much for your interest, and let's talk talk so, today on panel discussion about this. Thank you so much, Kirsti. So we have a quite good time to have a quick comments, questions. So our quest, you're welcome. So comments, questions, yes, the, still, challenge, whatever you want. Still time for some questions. So, hands up. Yeah. Please wait a little bit because you're Stigmatizing. So, do you think that uh, stigmatizing phones and technology in school makes children uh, use phones to escape and to rest instead of use them as a learning tool? Yes, that's what actually, what is the gap? Thank you for that question. Because what I'm trying to tell teachers that saying, put your phones away, is not the solution, but how to learn to use mobile devices constructively for learning. Now what children learn, they learn outside school, only to use them for entertainment. Uh, we have been developing this bring your own device kind of practices where anybody can take their phones from their pockets and start uh, participating in a learning session. But if students are really engaged and they learn how to use them, and I was talking about this co-regulation, they also start saying, oh, put that away, now you are disturbing our learning process. So they need to uh, learn ways of, instead of putting them away, to regulate how to use them in a meaningful way for learning, and not only for entertainment. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Yes? Can you hear? I, I, can, repeat, I can repeat the question. I may be here. Yeah. Yes, so we have a, no, unfortunately not. What we have, is we have STEP, which is subject matter teaching English program. Anybody can apply, uh, but this is actually, to our program is harder to get in than to medical school. It's the most difficult program to get in. It's five year bachelor master program, five and a half year class teacher education program. And many of my students actually become researchers. They do master thesis also. Uh, but many of them go to schools, and now especially when we start this phenomenon-based education, they are the only ones who, who study in small groups, make phenomenon-based projects during their study time. And we are tr truly trying to have this kind of a collaborative um, 
learning methods and democratic education. So now they actually very much want it in Finnish schools. They get jobs very easily because they are one of the few people who, who've been studying how to promote agency in the classroom. We are not perfect, but we, at least we are trying. <laughs> but they are brilliant, these students, and, and it's really a pleasure to work in this teacher education program. Hello, I'm Khalil from South Africa. Uh, thank you very much for the thing you highlighted. I'm also a student of Northwest University. I have done education diploma. Yeah. Through your research and the crisis that South Africa is facing with education, especially in the rural area, do you think it's going to take us in a very five to ten years to change? Or it will take me another century because South Africa, currently they call democratic country. But in education, I really don't find it. Thank you. Um, I didn't have the time to talk about our latest project, it's called Sustainable Education Design. And actually what we are now doing is we are building a, an ecological wooden school, which would be reasonably cost efficient, with solar panels, so that it makes it possible to have Wi-Fi, even in rural areas. But we are building a pilot in Windhoek area, and then thinking of scaling it up to more rural areas. Uh, Finland has very old relations to Owambo land, and there are lots of um, there is a lot of goodwill to start that in Namibia. But I'm hoping it would spread, and there are other similar projects. And what we think is we need to have this kind of whole package where we have pedagogy, technologies, uh, ecological uh, solutions for energy, and to scale it up as much as we can. Um, usually, export. The problem is also always you have to be very culturally sensitive. You cannot go and say, this is Finnish school. You have to go there and live with the people. And I've noticed that how student activating pedagogy they already have, for instance, in Orange Farm uh, preschools. Uh, so I think there is a lot of fertile soil uh, to do these kinds of things. And I know many people doing very good things, but I... I really, when I went there and I, I was with all this ideological thinking, I can see that there are lots of challenges. Uh, yes, if you want to learn more, it's, it's sustainable education design, uh, educationdesign.fi. It's a very new project. We just started. Um, we got funding from Finnish uh, Science and Technology Foundation educationdesign.fi. You can see all my project in here, wiredminds.fi. So I've collected... Then we have time to take yeah, two sorry. questions yet, and then we... It's difficult to see Take here. a break. Hi. Um, I was involved in the evaluation of Reform 94 and Reform 97 in Norway yeah. a few years ago. And uh, it, phenomen, phenomenon learning was introduced into the upper secondary schools as part of the curriculum reform. And I talked with many students in several, I can't say it, Vidra Gawonda School. Um, and often the students would say to me, yes, it's a very good idea. But when the teacher says, you can organize your project with your peers, I ask myself, what does the teacher want me to study? Because he or she will give me the grade. So my question is, how do you avoid the assessment tail wagging the dog in your reforms? Uh, that's a very good question. And actually, we have the same problem when introducing such projects in, uh, in middle school and high school, uh, because people are constantly concerned about grades and assessment. Uh, what we are trying to teach our students, for instance, when we do phenomenon-based projects in the teacher education, the group is actually grading itself. <laughs> And it's, there is no examination, but there is a panel of, of didactics from mathematics, mother tongue, arts, and so on. So the panel is then, teach, students are grading themselves, and the, the panel, and they are usually creating something like a blog, video, performance, and all kinds of reports that they can show that they have learned also the contents. Um, so, but the, the assessment is uh, really crucial thing here. So you just have to trust that, that in addition to all these subject matter things, you learn these 21st century skills and you should actually assess them rather than only content knowledge.